Hey, it's Jason here, and I'm going to be talking this time about the nature of motion. Uh, we're looking at rotating reference frames. So why would we look at rotating rec reference frames in this video? Well, first, we're going to try to get at this concept because as somebody on the channel asked about, do something about Lagrange points. And I thought, okay, Lagrange points are pretty interesting. They have to do with rotating reference frames. But also, we can look at the Foucault pendulum. And that helps us understand rotating reference frames. It also, also gives us a chance to start to understand the Kerr metric for black holes. But the uh, important thing is, is that we can use rotating reference frame to help us understand that the Earth is actually a sphere rotating on its axis and moving through space. And that's where we eventually get to with the Foucault pendulum. There's a lot of things that we have from rotating reference frames, uh, including including uh, you know the way the reason that uh, hurricanes rotate the way they do the Coriolis effect that happens on earth as well as centripetal forces and centrifugal forces one of those is real one of those is not so what we mean by real forces and fictitious forces we'll cover all that and we'll even dis discuss what we mean by an inertial reference frame which is very important so in order to get rotating reference frames we have to do a review of Newton's for uh, Newton's laws so let's start off with Newton's first law Newton's first law says that there is this thing called inertia and inertia is basically if nothing is acting on a piece of matter or mass then what it will do is it will either stay at rest or continue moving in a straight line without speeding up or slowing down so if it, it might, that's the concept and idea of inertia and in fact that defines what we mean by an inertial reference frame inertial reference frame is surrounds a, with a piece of matter a grid of rulers going every which way meaning 90 degrees forward backwards up down left and right as well as a stack of clocks all around it. that is called an inertial reference frame and you can think of it as centered on the mass you're talking about that's a good way of talking about it now an inertial reference frame is also will follow the mass if it's at rest or if it's moving in a constant speed or constant velocity in one direction. And that is the nature of inertia. We can define inertia with this P uh, arrow equals MV arrow. That's another thing with that's the momentum. And this momentum is, uh, is what's going to change with the second law of motion. So the definition of a force, a force is something that causes a mass to accelerate. And acceleration can either be a change of speed, it can be a change of direction, or it can be both. And an acceleration is a change in the rate of speed. You know what I mean? So we have velocity. Velocity is speed in one direction or some direct in a direction and if it changes either magnitude or or direction then you have an acceleration. So the we can write the math the uh, second law of motion either f, f equals ma or f equals dp dt which is the momentum the change in momentum with time. So the, 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 the dp dt version allows us to use like the rocket equation and some other thing where we would lose mass and so forth and so on. But we're not working looking at that this time. We just want to know, well, make you aware that the second law of motion can also apply to changes in mass. For this example, we're keeping masses constant and we're seeing what happens when a mass moves or accelerates or decelerates. So third law of motion by Newton is that any object that exerts a force on another object, that other object exerts an equal and opposite force back on it. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction and all forces come in pairs. This is very important. All true forces, all actual forces come in pairs. Um, and so that is an important thing to make sure we understand and keep in mind because forces are things that cause mass to move. Anything that causes mass to move in a weird way that doesn't have an equal and opposite reaction might not actually be what we call a force and we're going to get to that. That's what the purpose of looking at rotating reference frames is all about. But in an inertial reference frame, there's always an equal and opposite reaction. Anyway, 
So, so let's look at some second laws. Let's be really simple. So here is a, an acceleration. For every second it goes up, it goes 10 meters per second faster. That's another way of looking at it. And then if there must be an acceleration, if, the, if we start by going the direction of the red arrow, going down at 10 meters per second, and we end up going to the right at 10 meters per second, the speed hasn't changed, but the direction has. So there must have been an acceleration, meaning we stopped moving down and started moving right. So that meant that there was a, a change in the velocity. So for the third law, we can always look at like the, this kind of a funny thing. The ball's not moving on the table. It's at rest on the table. However, it's being acted on by the force of gravity. And the table is pushing up on the ball with exactly the same amount of force that gravity is pulling the ball down. So therefore, the, t the ball's at rest on the table. That's interesting to think because people don't tend to think, oh, it's a ball on the table. There's no forces acting on it. That is not true. The, the table is pushing back against the ball. Now, this, if this were out in space, like what this slide seems to make it appear like it is a floating in space, if they happen to be in contact, that means they're totally at rest with respect to each other and then there would be no forces. But I'm making this example on the surface of the Earth such that the green arrow down is due to gravity and the green arrow up is due to the force of the table. If we were to move this table to say the surface of a neutron star where the force of gravity is really strong, then the force pushing back by the table might not be enough and the table might squash down. Again. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The force of gravity is reacted against by the table's forces pushing up. So now what happens if we take that holy thing example and the ball might be spinning, or the table is spinning, or the room containing the ball and the table is spinning? Does that actually change anything? And the answer is yes. That is called a rotating reference frame. And a rotating reference frame is really important to understand almost of, well, a huge number of things in astrophysics and celestial mechanics and all sorts of stuff. And in fact, relativity relies on this as well. So we have to understand that rotating reference frames change how we do things. They don't change Newton's laws, but they do change how we interpret them. So let's now look at this disk. It's viewed edge on. And on the surface of this disk, it's like a platter or a plate or a record or something, uh, and let's say it, there's some mass object at the tip of the red of the purple arrow R, and that thing at the tip of the arrow is just where this mass lies, and it's rotating on the disk at that radius R, away from the center, which is the arrow going up, and the arrow going up just says, oh, if we're going up, then we're gonna go right, we're gonna go clockwise around it as viewed from the top of the arrow. Uh, the omega is indicating that we are looking at a constant angular velocity. It could be variable. The, the, the uh, angular velocity, meaning how fast it's going around, could change. It could also be changing direction. The direction of omega could change and the speed of omega could change. But let's just keep this really, really simple and make omega not change direction or speed. We're just going to keep it simple for this example because it's hard enough once you start adding in changes and things. So so for a constant angular velocity around an axis around the origin of this inertial frame. So now let's take our object and we're going to, we're going to take this so it's not an inertial frame because now we're going to rotate it through the inertial frame. Okay, so here we go. The rotation, by, by now the R, the, the arrow R is going to appear to go around in a circle like hands on a clock. That's what's going to happen. And so we can describe that by changing the dr dt, meaning dr dt is a way of saying a little change in the vector r with respect to time. And that's what we mean by that. The ratio of the change of the vector r with respect to time is equal to the, uh, uh, the angular velocity cross product with the radial with the radial vector. Now that cross product simply means an, uh, the right hand rule. So what we do is we curl, we, we think of our thumb, our right hand, thumb pointing up along the green arrow. Well, thumb hand, uh, take our hand, right hand, let's put it this way. Yeah, our, our right hand, take our fingers, 
and hold them straight up. And then that will be the point, direction your fingers are pointing, not your thumb, your fingers are pointing, is the uh, angular velocity. Now curl your right hand such that it bends towards the purple arrow R, and then you make a curl, and it curls around your thumb. Your thumb then points in the direction of the omega cross R. That is the cross product, and that's what we mean. There's that's why that car, the uh, the direction of where they're going, or the change in the change in the radial vector with respect to time, is that cross product. So that's how we define this thing. Um, now, again, these little arrows at the top means they're vectors, and they can change in both magnitude and direction. Um, but we're going to we're going to simplify this whole thing, but by making omega constant, so that we'll drop that little vector uh, notation at the top of it very very soon. So now we go look at suppose now now let's now that we've had defined how we're going to use our iner our non-inertial rotating reference frame. Now let's have the object that's at the tip of that arrow move with inside the rotating reference frame with some velocity uh, vector v, and we're going to use that v cat the, the little tip the little tick mark to denote things measured with respect to the moving reference frame. So if you're on the surface of the disk, it'll look like you're moving on the disk. Now that's very important to say because it could be constant in the disk, meaning you're just standing there and it's spinning around. Everything outside the disk is spinning, but you're not spinning. You're not moving on the disk. Here we're saying there's some velocity, some speed of direction on the surface of the disk, and that's what the tick mark is indicating. So we're just adding that in um, to say that this is an additional thing that we can have happen on the non-inertial reference frame. This will be important very soon. So now we're going to define something very important. We, we have to define these derivatives, meaning how much we change a little quantity with respect to time. And the that's what we mean by the d by dt, is d over dt. We're denoting some change in something with respect to time. And that's what these ratios are, a little bitty change in this thing compared to a little bitty change in some time derivative, in some time increment, and that we get in the two different reference frames. One is in the non-rotating reference frame, and one is in the rotating reference frame. The equation at the top of the screen, dr dt, is the, is the change in the radial vector in the non-rotating reference frame, meaning off the disk. So if you're outside the disk, you use the dr dt on the left-hand side. And we're going to keep trying to collect the things that are on the non-rotating reference frame on the left-hand side of the equal sign and the things that are associated with the rotating reference frame on the right-hand equals of the equal sign. So that's how we're going to try to divide these things up so that we understand <clears throat> which side of things we're on. And we're going to violate that a little bit, but we're going to try our best. So from the, the, uh, the fact we're going to say, since an object is stationary, in the rotating reference frame, but it appears to be moving in the non-rotating reference frame, then that's a very strange thing to say. It says the change in something on the in in the non-rotating frame is going to be different than the change in the rotating reference frame. So we can't make these two time derivatives the same thing. So that's where the real difference comes from, and that's where we drop down and look at the last equation at the bottom. We have now defined the change in the radial vector with respect to the time derivative on the rotating reference frame. That's how we've changed the vector. And so that's basically that we're not changing, we're not defining a new vector for the position, our, our arrow. We're, we're saying the velocity means that we have to change, we have to measure the, uh, the rotation, the, the time derivative, the time derivative inside the rotating reference frame differently. And that's what the bottom reference frame, uh, the bottom equation means. Okay, so let's rewrite this again with standard velocity notation. We got V, which is the velocity 
in, in the non -iner in the inertial reference frame on the left, and on the right we have the velocity in the non-inertial reference frame plus this little extra term that's due to the rotation. So those two velocities would be the same if omega was zero. But if omega is not zero, then they change. And this is simply the relationship between them and that thing on the right, the omega cross r, is just how we relate the two frames. That's all, that is difficult, that is the velocity transformation between the two frames. That's a very important thing. So now we've got these three equations which are all exactly the same. They're just denoted slightly differently. The top one is exclusively in the format of the radial vector that is moving in on, that is fixed on top of initially, fixed on top inside the rotating reference frame, but it is not fixed in the non-rotating reference frame. And so we just see that if we look closely, all of these things are identical uh, equations. So make sure, let's use the, and we're gonna use the top one now for a trick because look at the top one, it has one common element and that is the radial vector. So we're gonna use that as a trick. So let's take that first equation and extract the radial vector, which is the same thing throughout all of them. And we're gonna extract it, remove it, delete it, cut it, however you wanna say. And then we're left with this funny looking thing at the bottom, which is what we call an operator. And so this operator is a tool that operates on vectors that, uh, that, that shows how we transform one vector from one reference frame that is rotating into a reference frame that is non-rotating. The right-hand side is the is the non-rotating frame, uh, is the rotating frame, and the left-hand side is the non-rotating frame. So we can apply this to any vector. So we're going to apply this very soon. So let's operate now. Using that operator, we're going to operate on the velocity equation. Why? because if we take a change in time of velocity, we get an acceleration. So let's do that, and we get something that looks like this. So we've taken the operator, which are in the parentheses, the big tall parentheses, and we're operating on the velocity vector equation. So remember, we're keeping things on their correct sides. We're taking the, the left-hand side gets the left-hand side operator, and the right-hand side gets the right-hand side operator. And that's because we have to match our reference frames. So as we keep our reference frames matched, they will, we, we, uh, we will we'll be fine. But if we swap them around, we wouldn't be fine. That would be a stinker. It would be very unfriendly. We'd have to operate again or do undo the operation. So yeah, you could mix these frames up, but eventually you'd have to come back to this in order to make it legible and usable. And we just want to remember why we're, we're using these things. So left-hand side, we're gonna to try to keep it in a non-rotating frame, right-hand side, rotating frame. So we're keeping things together. All right, so now let's multiply out the right-hand side and collect the terms, and we see something that looks like the last equation there. So the first thing is the change in velocity uh, in the rotating frame with respect to the time measured in the rotating reference frame. That's easy enough. And then we have the omega cross the, uh, the dr dt and omega cross v, and then omega cross omega cross r, which is kind of funky. But if you look closely, the middle two terms are the same thing. So we can collect them. We can then de redefine the change in velocity with respect to time as acceleration. And that we can, if we say the acceleration equals dv dt, then we can say, wait a second, a hat, a tick vector, is the acceleration in the rotating reference frame, and a vector is the acceleration in the non-rotating reference frame. So we have these now two terms on the right when we do an acceleration or a change in the velocity inside of the rotating reference frame. It looks kind of it looks kind of crazy now. Now we're getting very complicated. However, it can be explained pretty easily. So the first term we can oh wait well we'll, we'll get to it but but those are our two terms and we now then remember that a equals dr dt squared, and that's the two, we're operating on the velocity vector twice, but 
If we multiply through by a mass, like a little m, a mass, and then we collect terms and put things on one side and put things on the other side, we can then say, wait a second, imagine that we're now sitting in the reference frame. So the left-hand side wasn't just an interesting place to put the non-rotating frame and the right-hand side to put it the rotating reference frame. Now we're going to say that the left-hand side is the, is the reference frame in which we are measuring things. So the left-hand side with this MA tick arrow is the place where we sit. Let's say we sit in the rotating reference frame. So then, I've, that's why I've rearranged the equation this way. Remember, this final equation says, on the left-hand side, we are in the rotating reference frame. So a mass times an acceleration inside a rotating reference frame is equal to some real force, some real force that's causing some sort of acceleration minus these two terms, which the first one is the centrifugal force, and it's called a pseudo force, and the, the far right hand, the second minus term, is called the Coriolis force. Now, the, it's important to note that a mass times an acceleration is a force, but the only one that's actually real is the capital F. That's the Newtonian force from the first, second, and third laws that we defined before. The other two terms that we're subtracting off of the real force are actually forces that arise because, or they're pseudo forces or fictitious forces that arise because we are measuring inside of a rotating reference frame. This is really important because these things wouldn't be there. Like the omega is there. If they go to zero, then F equals MA, right? But if you're inside of a rotating reference frame when you do your measurements, you will always have these things. Now, sometimes they're really small, like really tiny, but sometimes they are very big. So like a centrifugal pseudo force might be, uh, think of the, the fun house, right? So you go to a, a carnival and you're standing in this canister that looks, that looks like a ringed room and they spin you round and round and round and faster and faster and your back is slammed up against the wall all of a sudden they drop the floor out from under you and your feet are like you see 30 feet below you but you're slammed up against the wall. Why? Because you're in a rotating reference frame and because you're in a rotating reference frame you feel this pseudo centrifugal force. Is it pseudo really? No, you feel like you're being pushed out but the true force is the, is, is the thing that's causing you to move to the right. That is the thing that's actually caused, that there is a force that's pushing you around. It makes you feel like to your right, let's say the thing is rotating clockwise from above, you're actually, something's forcing the rotation of it and that's the force. There is no outward force. You are being accelerated around a curve. However, if you look across from you, you see everybody inside of, the, inside of this thing. You can move to the left, you can move to the right. Nobody appears to be moving and you can see straight across. Now, if you tried to throw a ball across, it would veer because the ball would seem to be moving across a, a, a the hall, the there the, across a tube. Now you can't throw a ball straight across inside the tube; it will curve, and that's the Coriolis pseudo force. So Coriolis pseudo force is actually the thing that is responsible for the uh, for hurricanes, the directions they they move, not bathtub drains. It's too small. It's too small an effect for bathtub drains, but it had to be taken into effect during the Second World War um, because artillery shells moved, uh, were, weren't hitting their targets. They were veering to the left or veering to the right, or as they were pointing north or south. And so they took that into account. Why do I call these pseudo forces or fictitious forces? They're actually real things. They're true things on the surface of the earth. They're not fake effects. But why do we call them pseudo forces? The reason we call them pseudo forces is because they do not obey Newton's third law. They do not have a back reaction. Nothing, they don't push against anything. They're the result of transforming from one reference frame to another. That's their reason for existing. So 
They, they are, they're pseudo forces. They're only there because of change in reference frame, nothing else. So the term fictitious force uh, sure sounds wrong, uh, but, it, 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 but they're, they're real effects, but they're effects because of the change, because we live on a rotating reference frame. Now it takes energy in order to keep the things rotating, so ultimately the omega comes from some force, right? Or comes from some momentum, right? So if there's no change in the rotation, then, it's, then there is an angular momentum for which that is conserved as well. But in order to spin something up, there had to be some sort of force in order to spin something up. But we're talking about a constant speed, a constant rotation, angular velocity, and really we should take those, those arrows off the omegas because we're pretending. However, when we want to talk about Lagra the Lagrange points, or when we wanted to wish to talk about say a Foucault pendulum then we do need those ha those arrows on the omega because they can change with respect to latitude they can change with respect to how fast something is spinning or slowing down so the most important thing here is that we don't live in an inertial reference frame because the earth is a sphere that's rotating on its axis and orbiting the sun. But more specifically for the purposes of this, we're rotating on our axis. And so the Earth's rotation on its axis is, is, is the omega that we're talking about. And the omega we're talking about is the rotation of the Earth. But if you're on the surface of a sphere, then you have to take into account where you are, latitude and so forth. But that's, where the, that's why that's a vector. Anyway, so this is the transformation of Newton's laws into a rotating reference frame where the rotation is simply due to a constant rotation. Now, Newton's laws of motion apply to this, but that's why we call those things pseudo forces or fictitious forces because they're only the result of a rotating reference frame. And we'll use these things in the future when we talk about the Foucault pendulum and Lagrange points and so forth. Um, so there you go. And we're back with the next in our series on rotating reference frames and how we can actually relate that to the rotation of the Earth and show that the Earth is actually a sphere and is rotating and what we mean by all that. We're also going to continue developing the idea of the Foucault pendulum and get close to the three body problem and Lagrange points, that's Lagrange points at some point. So this is the second in the series, uh, so let's continue on. First thing is that we're looking at is last time in the first video, we derived this equation which shows the effective force on the left hand side of the equation due to the rotation of the reference frame around some sort of rotation axis. Uh, the capital F vector that we see there is the only true force in the system, whatever it is. It can be a series of forces, it can be just one, uh, but that's the only true force, meaning it's the only Newtonian force that has an equal and opposite reaction. The other two terms are actually cause accelerations and cause forces, but they're only the result of the rotating reference frame, and so do not have an equal and opposite reaction inside of them. Um, so that's interesting and that's why they're called fictitious forces or pseudo forces because they do act in reality. It's just they do not have an equal and opposite reaction. So on the left hand side that's why we denote the mass times the acceleration with a little tick mark there that shows that the tick mark is the things that are measured in the rotating reference frame. So we're now going to look at the effect on things on the surface of the earth due to its rotation. So the first thing we're going to look at is centrifugal acceleration. In fact that first the second term on the uh, the first term on the left hand side of that equation that we looked at before, that is actually the centrifugal acceleration. That's what we're going to analyze. So let's get go back and we're going to reframe this thing from what we saw in the previous video. We're going to define our non-rotating inertial reference frame to be the center of the Earth. 
And that allows us to say, okay, up or the Z axis goes towards the North Pole from the center of the Earth. And say the X axis goes out to some point on the equator and the Y axis would go 90 degrees from that also along the equator. We could define that wherever we want. Maybe it surfaces at zero degrees latitude and zero degrees longitude, whatever you want. But that's the inertial reference frame. Now the Earth rotates around that inertial reference frame, and so at the surface of the Earth, or some distance from the center of the Earth in that inertial reference frame that's rotating around, we have that r, that little green r vector. Now we're using the surface of the Earth, but we could just assume that there's some goo or layer, but we're just positing that we're looking at the surface of Earth. And so R can be like, this, like below ground or above ground or in the air or what have you. Um, but the radius of the Earth is a different thing. Now, how fast is this rotation? Well, omega vector, which is the, what the arrow means, shows the direction and magnitude of the rotation axis. And the, mag the rotation axis is through the North Pole, and we consider it up to be the North Pole, and it goes through 2 pi radians in 24 hours, so that is uh, 7.27 times 10 to the minus 5 radians per second, and that is the angular speed with which it is, with which the Earth is rotating. And if we then say that we're going to have our now rotating reference frame, so someplace on the surface of Earth will be our rotating reference frame, and it'll be situated at some latitude lambda above the equator. And once we get to that rotating reference frame, we now then say, oh, look, there's our x's and y's and z's, and that's our frame that we're going to be looking at that is rotating around the inertial reference frame. So the rotating reference frame is a non-inertial reference frame, which is important to remember. All right, so we want to have something that is sitting on our you know, reference frame, an object stationary on the Earth's surface, so probably like a tree or you know somebody falling asleep or what have you. And the object's apparent equation of motion, which we can derive from above, is now the mass time mass of the object times its acceleration tick inside of the rotating reference frame is equal to some force, and I use the lowercase f because whatever that is, we don't know yet. And that'll be, we'll take a, now we're looking at only the centrifugal aspect. So it's stationary. Remember the previous equation had two parts, one for the location and one for it if it was actually moving inside that reference frame. And we're saying it's not moving inside that reference frame. And the lowercase r here is a vector from the inertial reference frame to its position wherever that thing is in the rotating reference frame. So that lowercase r is the vector in the inertial reference frame. We've got to transfer that to the non-inertial reference frame shortly. Okay, so let's make a lot of simplifying assumptions. First, we're going to have only one force, one true force, the force of gravity, so we can replace F, hat, F arrow with mass times the gravitational acceleration. And the gravitational acceleration will always point towards the center of the Earth. And we're going to also assume, just to help make things better, that the Earth is a perfectly flat sphere. Eh, you know, why not? It's not a bad assumption. But, you know, it's good to tell you what we're doing here. Uh, and further, we're going to assume that the object is on the surface of the Earth. It's not jumping up or down. It's not like 10 feet up or 10 feet below or 100 miles up, what have you. And so the displacement factor from the inertial reference frame, which is at the center of the Earth, to the rotating reference frame shall be the Earth's radius vector. That actually makes things a little easier. Also gives us a number to work with. Uh, the acceleration on the Earth's ob the object is then the acceleration measured in the rotating reference frame at the Earth's surface, which is really what we're going for. And now we, that equation simplifies to the above. So G here is the ex the G tick is the effective acceleration at a point on the Earth's surface due to equals the actual true force of gravity, which is g without a tick, arrow, subtracting, you take away this, this uh, centrifugal parameter. Um, that's, the g is, always has a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second squared pointing 
downward, which in this reference, which in the inertia, in the rotating reference frame is always negative z. Uh, but the centrifugal acceleration is normal or perpendicular to the Earth's axis of rotation. And it always points away from that axis, always does. Centrifugal acceleration always points away from the axis of rotation. So that makes it a little complicated on the surface of sphere because you have there's where our latitude thing comes in. So the magnitude of the centrifugal acceleration is omega squared. See, there's two omegas in that cross product times the r. But r is the radius vector from the center of the Earth, but we want it from the center of the rotation axis, not from the center of the Earth, and so that's where that rho comes in. That's not a p, that is a Greek letter rho, and that can be represented by the radius of the Earth times the cosine of the latitude, and that gives us the, the distance from the rotation axis at that latitude. So the radius of the Earth is approximately 6.37 times 10 to the 6th meters, which is a long way. And that means that rho squared r has a uh, value of 0.0337 meters per second squared, which is a lot smaller than 9.8 meters per second squared. It's important to note that this is hundreds of times smaller than the gravitational force. And therefore, the cosine of the latitude means that at the, at the maximum, it is maximum at the equator and quickly drops to zero as you get closer and closer to the poles. Let's just remember this number and continue our quest. So our setup so far, we're going to make the uh, choose the Cartesian axis, the xyz axis, on the rotating reference frame such that the z tick, and this is always the tick marks, always represent the things in the rotating reference frame, z tick axis points directly up, so wherever you are on the surface of the Earth, look straight up, that's z. X tick is going to point directly at the north rotation axis pole, not the north magnetic pole, and y axis is going to point directly to the west. So here that's out of the picture, directly straight towards you out of the, out of the video. There's our rho in the orange, which is the value of the cosine of the, of, of the radius of the Earth times the cosine of the lambda, which is the latitude. And so I actually wrote that in there to show where we have two actual accelerations. The yellow arrows are the true accelerations that, or those two accelerations that we're going to be looking at. Downward is towards the center of the Earth is the gravitational acceleration. That is a true force due to something, and the accelerate, which means that it has, there's an equal and opposite reaction for, to that force. The centrifugal acceleration has no equal, equal and opposite thing associated with it, so it's a pseudo force. But it still does things, even though it's called a pseudo force, but it's a force that exists simply because of the rotation of the reference frame. I'm going to keep saying this because it's really important to note that people always hear that pseudo force, fictitious force. No, these things are real, but they do not behave in the Newtonian style, I meaning they don't behave in the third law. Okay, so we have two forces, two forces we're working with, two accelerations we're working with, and there's our Cartesian reference frame. So let's kind of rearrange things just a bit. Uh, let's extract out the parts and rearrange it so it's kind of like at the surface of the Earth. So x tick points due north, z tick points upwards. There's our little lambda, which shows our, our the, the latitudes deviation, how the centrifugal acceleration is deviating as a function of latitude. And the true gravitational acceleration, as we expect, is down, or into the surface of the Earth, straight down. Now, we can decompose the centrifugal acceleration into two components, which are shown in the blue arrows, one going up and one going to the south, if we're in the northern hemisphere. So we now have a, the, uh, the, the omega can be looked at as the rotation of, we're going to need that really quick, right? Because the, it, the rotation uh, axis, the, the rotation vector, has two components. One that is a z component, which is omega sine theta, or lambda, which is the, which is the, um, the latitude, and one that is o omega co cosine of 
lambda, which is for the, for the north-south direction. Now the r is pointed downwards and the g is pointed downwards, and they are vectors too. So these are our three vectors that we're going to really be working with. And that's what we have saw before, so we actually had to define them in this parentheses notation, where the x is the first entry, so x tick is omega cosine lambda, y tick, which is out of the frame, none of these things go out of the frame, the radius of the Earth is not up and out, nor is g, and neither is the, uh, is the centrifugal force. The centrifugal force, acceleration, is vertical or northward. It is, has nothing to do with the left, right, west, or east direction. So that's why we see a zero in the second tick for it. And the centrifugal acceleration does have a z component, meaning up and down, because we're always going away from the rotation axis. So there will be some portion of that. And r always points towards the center of the Earth, as, as well as g. So now we've got, to, we've got all our stuff defined. We now need to do the vector cross product below. And vector cross product, those are just times. That's a very special thing called a cross product. So we need to review what we mean by a cross product because we're going to take the cross product of a cross product, which is eh, it can be kind of crazy. So we've got three vectors. We're taking a cross product of omega cross r and then omega cross omega cross r. So let's look at that stuff because you probably are rusty, you know, who goes and looks at this stuff on a daily basis? Probably not you, and I'm going to assume you're not. So here we go. Vector cross product is defined as follows. We call it the curl can be because it's used to define flows around points. That's a good way of thinking about it. But we always have two vectors. Let's call, we're going to define it using the letters A and B. So we have vector A and vector B, and they can be decomposed into their XYZ components. And there's a little A, with, there's a part that's going in the X component for each of them. And that's what the A sub X, A sub Y, A sub Z, and B sub X, Y, Z all indicate. So these vectors can be decomposed, just like I decomposed the, uh, the, the acceler the uh, centrifugal acceleration into an up and down to an up down left right and backwards and forwards any vector can be decomposed into its constituent parts that when added together are the vector so the definition of the curl or cross product of two vectors is that crazy looking formula below and so you can see that for each of the directions x, y, and z, or z if you're over in London, the x, y, z components, none of them contain the components of the vector uh, x. Like say, notice the first component in x does not contain a component of x, meaning you only have the components of y, z meaning something that's perpendicular to that axis. So we're always looking at a rotation around that particular axis for that. So these are all frame rotations or rotations. So if there is no z component or if there's no y component, let's say there's no z or y component, then you only have an x component. That means you're rotating around the x axis. If there's no y or z component, you're only rotating around the y axis. Right? So it's, it's, it's pretty interesting in that regard. But this is the definition of the curl and cross product. So what we'll do is we're going to now take the values of those vectors that we have and plug it into this very nasty equation, knowing that, remember, the, B, the y components are all zeros, so that'll come up, and so many of the components are zero. So let's go take a look at what that means. Uh, so let's first, yeah, this is a crazy looking thing, and you know, here we go, here's equations. But first we're going to look at omega cross r, and I've kept the definitions in a little side off there, and we've, I'm just plugged in for each of the a sub x, a sub y's, and b sub x, b sub y's their appropriate values for omega and r. And I put the dots in there as a way of showing multiplication. And I've taken the x, y, and z values from the parentheses definitions to the left in that little subpart over there. And we see that there's a whole bunch of zeros. And if you multiply by zero, you get zero, right? So the x component, there is no x component to omega cross r. There is, uh, there is no z component to omega cross r, but there is a y component. The first bit is zero, but the second bit is going to be r omega cosine of lambda. So what does this mean? That means that 
you, we can look at it as the right-hand rule. It's a very good way of looking at it, the right-hand rule. The omega cross r, r is pointing up and down, and omega is pointing a different direction, like, but it's only pointing in the uh, x or z component. So we can take our hand and say, point your fingers in the direction of the rotation axis vector, omega, you're on your right hand, it's called the right hand rule, point your fingers, make your thumb go directly 90 degrees so you kind of have a flat hand, and your thumb is pointed away from your fingers at 90 degrees, take your fingers and point them towards the direction of the rotation axis, and the cross product means curl your hand towards the R vector, and your thumb then points in the direction of the cross product and that is the y component. So r is only z, and omega is, is both x and y, so you can say curl it towards that, and all of a sudden it's going in that uh, across the surface of the Earth parameter, which would be a west-east. Now then, that's not the end of the story, because I said, remember, it has to go away from the rotation vector, right? It has to go away from the x-axis. So now we cross it again. We cross the result above with omega again, and we plug and chug those numbers for zeros and what have you, and the zeros appear in the dots as we have it, um, and we end up with no y component, but we do end up with an x component and a z component with those various magnitudes. Notice we have, again, the omega squared r and omega squared r cos theta, which is kind of what we expected from before, because that is the omega squared r cos theta. Well, r cos theta is our original, uh, is, is the amount, is the, is the row that we saw before, which is the perpendicular distance from the cent from the rotation axis. So the omega squared is because there's two omegas, right? We're not getting rid of their magnitudes, but we're modifying it by their uh, by the distance to the from the rotation axis. And so there's where the r cos theta is. The sine theta omega, I'm sorry, not theta, the sine lambda and extra cos cosine lambda are because we're looking at something that's changing latitude or a difference in latitude. And we want to see the magnitude of this double cross product at different latitudes. So let's take a look and see what that all rolls up to be. All of the above then says the apparent gravitational acceleration is given below. So we've replaced that original thing, g little tick or vector, with the above in this kind of parentheses notation x, y, z. So x is the first entry, 0 is the y entry, and z is the last entry. So let's look at the last entry first. That makes the most sense because g is downward, so it's negative, because z hat is up. So g downward would be the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration towards the center of the Earth. That's why it's negative. And then there's something that kind of pushes it outward, which is, has the magnitude of omega squared r cosine squared of the latitude of lambda. So this whole thing, this g tick, and there's this, but the x thing is very is also there, but there's no g in that because that is x, and x is either north or south. So the north-south thing does not, doesn't have the uh, gravitational acceleration component, neither does the y component, which is east or west. And there is no y component, east or west, to the uh, centrifugal force, or centrifugal acceleration. Uh, yeah, you're gonna, you, you hear me make that mistake all the time, because it's a fictitious force, but it's a real acceleration. It's kind of a funny thing. Anyway, but. Uh, it, it's hard to keep it straight sometimes when you're talking fast. Off we go. Uh, so the magnitude of g tick vector is approximately just the x, the z value, because the first bit in x is actually quite small. It's a very small thing, because always cosine lambda times sine theta is always going to be something less than 1 times something less than 1, and at either the equator or the poles, that's going to be 0. So that's always going to be a very much smaller value than anything else 
when you take the magnitude. So how do we get the magnitude of this? Really strictly speaking, we take the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared, and then we take the square root of that. But that's really approximately just the magnitude of the, of the z component, because the x component is so very tiny compared to the other. So when we look at that, the magnitude of it is roughly the gravitational acceleration with a little bit less uh, of due to the centrifugal acceleration away from the center of the Earth. And so that's actually a very small amount. It's about 0.3%. It's a very small amount. It's three, 300 times smaller than the expected, and that's the maximum it gets at the equator. It's 300 times smaller than the acceleration due to gravity. But that is still measurable. And that therefore means that the Earth bulges slightly at the equator. That is really a real effect of this thing because the Earth rotates, so it bulges, and that's in, as a result of the lessening of the gravitational acceleration due to the fact that the entire Earth is rotating. If the Earth did not rotate, there would be no bulge. There it is. Very simple. So it also means that you weigh just a little bit less at the equator than you do at the poles. Uh, one third of a percent less. So what would that mean? So if you weigh 200 pounds at the equator, at, if you weigh 200 pounds at the, at the North Pole, at the equator, you would weigh one third of a pound less? Yeah, one third of a pound. No, two thirds of a pound less. That's actually pretty significant. You'd lose two-thirds of a pound by going from the North Pole to the South Pole. That doesn't mean you're losing mass. That means you're losing weight. Weight and mass are not the same thing. So another consequence of it is that your, the, the apparent gravitational has a horizontal component going north or south. So there, that means that, you, that a plumb line held still over the Earth's surface deviates slightly towards the equator. That's really interesting. So it swings out towards the equator. At the North Pole, it doesn't swing at all. Uh, at, the, at the equator, it does not swing at all. At the poles, it does not swing at all. But roughly about 45 degrees is where it has its maximum. And therefore, you can see what the angle of deviation roughly is across the north uh, as the as you as you traverse from lower magnet lower latitudes to higher latitudes and the theta of deviation theta is just a, an angle of deviation and that's approximately the equation that you see below which is about a, bit, a tenth of a degree times the sine of twice the latitude. And the twice the latitude comes from the cosine sine theta thing, which is a trigonometric uh, identity that the cosine, si co cosine of an angle times the sine of an angle, and then the sine of the other angle times the cosine of, the, of, the, of, the, of that angle, the sum of those two things is equal to uh, the sine of angle plus angle. So if they're all at the same angle, then sine of 2 theta omega equals cosine that lambda plus sine lambda divided by 2. That's where the divided by 2 part comes from. It's a trigonometric identities. So essentially, there's a very tiny angular um, shift or swing that something has due to the Earth's gravitational rotation. Now notice that R is a is a function of is the radius of the earth and g is the gravitational acceleration due to the earth if you make r in this case really small then the defla and the same gravitational force as you shrink that down that that number will also shrink as well but if you increase the gravitational acceleration the or or uh, yeah if you greatly increase the gravitational acceleration uh, then you're also going to, you're go if you increase it, you're going to decrease the, uh, the swing. But if you spin it faster and faster and faster, like the omega squared, the faster you spin it, the greater the deflection shall be. 
So there are some astronomical objects, like neutron stars, which are spinning at hundreds of times a second, and they have the mass of something like the Sun. But their rotation is probably not bulged too much, because the gravitational acceleration at the surface of a neutron star is extraordinarily large. There probably is some budging, but that causes incredible stresses across a neutron star. But that's not our point here. We're just looking at the rotation, uh, the, the swing, the deviation of a plumb line from true as, as, a, function of, uh, as a function of latitude. Well, this always means that if you are, uh, you, if you lean, you are leaning slightly southward when you visit New York City. <laughs> and New York City is roughly about the latitude where it's pretty big. Uh, so you are leaning southward, no matter what you do, you got to 0.1 degree lean south. That's kind of a funny thing to think about. And if you visit Perth, Australia, you got a 0.1 degree roughly uh, lean north towards the equator. This lean is always towards the equator. So there's a bit more about the centrifugal acceleration and what we experience inside a rotating reference frame. We will always have some sort of effects on the surface of the Earth due to the fact that the Earth's rotation is there. We can measure the plumb lines that there is a deviation of this of, from true uh, due to a hanging object, because weight is different than something that hangs, and so if you have a long enough measurement, you can actually probably see it, but that, that is a very, very tiny measurement, and hard to, uh, not difficult to measure, but you can imagine some methods by which we can measure that, as well as you have some lessening of the weight and the bulging of the Earth, and the bulging of the Earth is a measurable quantity. And uh, that's important to note. It's also important to note that the bulging of the Earth is, a, is due to the rotation of the Earth, and that's actually something that can be measured. So we're finding ways to show that both the Earth is a sphere and is rotating. Next time we're going to go and look at the centripetal. We're going to look at the centripetal, uh, not the centrifugal or centripetal aspect. We're going to look at the Coriolis effect, which is the second term in that big long equation at the top, and eventually that will get us to a Foucault pendulum, which is the measurement of the Earth's of the Earth's uh, of the Earth's rotation. We're just starting in again with the third in a series on rotating reference frames from Newtonian mechanics. And so this time we're going to look at Coriolis acceleration, which is the third part of a rotating reference frame on the surface of the on the surface of a sphere, specifically Earth, we're using for now, but uh, we can always look at it from a from a, any rotating reference frame on the surface of anything. So let's actually go back and review our equation that we looked at that we derived in the first video and manipulated the second term in the in the previous video. And what we're looking at here again, just to review, is on the left hand side of the equation is the effective force on in a rotating reference frame equals due to a true force, some Newtonian force, which obeys all three of Newton's laws. And then it's adjusted by these other two, which are effects directly related to the idea that you're in doing your measurements in a rotating reference frame. So the F is a true force. It could be anything. It could be a tension. It could be a gravity. It could be any set of forces that causes masses to move, which also has uh, obeys Newton's third law, which is equal and opposite reactions. The other two components on the right do not obey those laws, and so we typically call them fictitious or pseudo forces. But in this sense, they actually cause a real thing, so that's a very bad term. I hate that word, fictitious force, because these effects are real, so it's not fictitious. They just don't obey Newton's third law. So we can call them non-Newtonian if you like. Anyway, so what we're looking at is the Coriolis acceleration, and that is, or the force in this derivation, if you see it below, that would be a force version. But previously we were looking at the centrifugal acceleration, which is the middle term. Now we're going to look at the second, second of these, the Coriolis force. And this thing only affects things that are moving, not stationary. So if something is not moving at all, if it's stationary, it, in a rotating reference frame, it does not experience an acceleration. The mass m does not experience an acceleration. So that's, there's the big omega, which indicates a, uh, a vector of, of rotation about an axis, and the v tick means we're measuring 
the velocity of something as measured in the rotating reference frame. So let's look at these reference frames again. It's the same thing we did in the previous two videos. We're looking at our, our rotating reference frame is Earth, which is a sphere that happens to be rotating on its axis. It's not flat. Uh, so the Earth has the equator and the rotation axis is the North Pole through the South Pole. Rotation axis, not the, not the magnetic pole. And once again, we're indicating that by a green vector that's poking up out of the North Pole and we're rotating a little line around it to indicate that that is its rotation direction. But we could always assume a right-hand rule, which is our standard assumption, and say omega with an arrow across it is a vector that is a rotation vector. And it's pointing in a particular direction according to a right-hand rule. And what do we mean by right-hand rule? So take that green arrow that's pointing up to that little dot, the dotted green arrow that's pointing up to the omega arrow, the omega vector, and Think of it as your right hand, take your thumb at arm's length, put your thumb up, and curl your fingers around. The curl of your fingers around your thumb on your right hand indicates the rotation axis. If that's the root, if we're doing a right hand rule, which which is very standard, which is what we always use for rotation as a standard across all of physics, is that we have a right hand rule. And so as you curl your fingers around, if it's going in that direction, that curling direction, knuckles to fingertips, then the thumb is pointed in the direction of the rotation axis, and that's the direction of the vector. Okay, the inertial reference frame, the Newtonian inertial reference frame is the center of the Earth, and we're using as vertical up towards the rotation axis, one of the things, and along the equator, and then out of the screen for the third of the axes. Um, then it's separate, there's a, then there is, a, then the rotating reference frame itself is offset from the inertial reference frame on the surface of the sphere, to by the lowercase r vector that goes to the surface. Uh, it just so happens to be the same as the radial vector, capital R in the lower left. But in this case, you know, it could be above or below. You could drill a hole down beneath or fly a plane above. That would be the little r. Um, but right now we're going to make them equal just to make things a lot simpler. Uh, and so that little r is at some latitude uh, from the equator. And the rotating reference frame is defined, of course, to have z being straight up, x being pointed towards north, and y being to pointed towards the west. And that allows us to have a right-hand rule of x to y to z. Okay, so there's our rotating reference frames, and so now let us consider only the effect. We're going to ignore the uh, centrifugal acceleration at this point, but now let's consider the effect of some mass, m, falling under the force of gravity in that rotating reference frame on the surface of Earth. So we define those Cartesian axes as above, so there's our z-axis up and x, y is horizontal, and then so forth and so on. Uh, but we can now deduce that the Cartesian equations of motion, using the cross product that I defined and talked about in a greater extent in the previous video, uh, we can use the cross product of omega cross v, and to notice that I've gotten rid of the masses there, because f equals ma, and mass and the acceleration here is the acceleration only due to gravity, and that's what the g arrow uh, tick, g arrow tick is the effective gravity as seen on the rotating reference frame, as measured on the rotating reference frame, and that's equal to the actual gravitational uh, acceleration in the inertial reference frame, and then it's adjusted, or there's a part that's subtracted, and that's twice the um, the rotation vector cross product with the with the with the velocity on in the rotating reference frame. So go back and look at my previous video on the uh, on, to learn how to actually what the cross product is. But if we plug in all the numbers, and there's our our little vectors I'm giving us are giving the most important things on the lower left there, kind of smallish, uh, but we can see that the cross product, uh, the v sub z, z's and y's and x's, those should really have ticks on them because we're measuring them in the rotating reference frame. But the cross product looks uh, works out to be this. I've included the zeros uh, that we see from the two vectors that we're looking at. Now the, vector, the velocity can be in all three directions, x, y, and z, with x being north, y being pointed, uh, the y vector 
the zero of it being pointed due west and z being pointed due up. So that's why the g is negative because it's down uh, and as well as the other part of it too. So let's collect all these terms and just look at the accelerations of each and that implies that, uh, well uh, I've, I've changed my notation a little bit too. So the dot over a given variable indicates a derivative with respect to time, and that's what the dot triple bar equals d over dt is, is to be indicating. So if you got two dots, it's two derivatives, and a single dot means one derivative. Uh, and we have the effective uh, acceleration in the x direction, which is just one of the three components of the g tick arrow in the way upper left there. So that g tick arrow has three components, one in each direction, and we add them together to get the total vector equation. And these three components are, one in the x direction, we have just something associated with the latitude, which is that sine of lambda. And there the, of course, you have the magnitude of the cross product there too. Uh, the y vector is dependent both on the lati in latitude in two ways. One, uh, and, and you see these things are dependent upon each other. So the acceleration in the x direction is dependent upon the speed or velocity in the speed in the y direction. And the acceleration in the y direction is dependent on the speed in the x direction and the speed in the z direction. So that's interesting, isn't it? So the z direction hat is essentially vx hat. See, if you look closely, I've just, tr I've just translated v sub z into z dot tick. They're the same thing. So from the first equation, uh, v sub y is y tick dot, and v sub x is x tick dot below. So that's what the transformation I did between those two sets of equations is. And so I've broken them out from that parentheses notation to making it three specific equations uh, each for each component. And so those dots indicate derivatives with respect to time of a given variable. So they are measurements in the x, y, and z direction, uh, but they're all measurements of velocity and acceleration. That's all we have there. So we, I've also neglected the centrifugal acceleration just to make this simple. I really want to be able to do that. Uh, just like we did, we're breaking things down. Uh, and so we also, I've also neglected air resistance, which is a big thing. It's much bigger than the Coriolis effect. So Coriolis effect is nullified by that. And Coriolis effect is really small. It doesn't work in your bathtub. Sorry, that's just too bad. It doesn't work in your bathtub. You do not see the Coriolis effect. That is due to the simple design of the tub and the design of the pipes. Okay, so uh, I'm just trying to keep things simple, as you can see. Uh, and if we really want to do this, we could imagine that there's no air resistance, and so we could just get rid of all the air on the Earth, and everybody has a bad day. But now let's not talk about that, because <laughs> that's a good day. Uh, so let's actually then manipulate these equations, and we'll now consider a particle. And we got to take this e equations of motion and do something. So far they've been exact, but now we're going to start to make a series of approximations in order for us to understand and better understand to us to understand the Coriolis effect as well as its magnitude. So let's just now take something and simply drop it from a height and just above the Earth's surface, so it's going to be dropping, say, but the height that it's dropping from is much smaller than the radius of the Earth. And uh, we're also going to assume that the Coriolis of force is, is a much smaller effect than the force of gravity, which it is. Therefore, and this is where a lot of people will get bent out of shape, you can treat this thing as a very small parameter and to lowest order. What do we mean by lowest order? It means we're taking a Taylor expansion and the Taylor expansion, we're getting rid of all of the terms that have uh, powers of omega that are, well, one or greater in this case. So we're getting, we're just getting rid of it. Uh, but that's what we mean by lowest order. You can take any function and turn it into a polynomial expansion. Some are finite, some are infinite, and those are, uh, and we can then say this, a, this a function is a series of polynomials, and they are in higher and higher and higher 
orders of magnitude. So when we say the orders of magnitude, the equations above would have some values of the magnitude of omega, and that omega would be in the cosine, would be 1 plus the cosine of the angle squared, or the angle squared over, over 2, I believe it is. Yes, it is. And two, so two, 2 squared over 2, and so on and so on. So we're going to get rid of it because we do not, we don't care about that, because it's very small. So therefore, therefore, we're approximating the acceleration in the z direction to be only due to the acceleration due to gravity. Now, we're okay in saying that because the deflection that is implied by that z double dot is small, and we're going to see that below uh, very shortly. So is z tick, then we can simply integrate, if we, if we continue down this parameter, of this, this direction of saying that omega is small compared to the uh, compared to the Coriolis force is small compared to the acceleration due to gravity, then we can say that z double dot tick, meaning the acceleration due, the acceleration in the z direction in the rotating preference frame is just that of of the uh, of gravity of the real gravity. So it's an approximation. I shouldn't use an equal sign there. It's an approximation, but we're going to keep it as an equal sign just because. But I just want to make sure you know what we're doing here. And you can integrate that in a standard way to get the equation below for z tick, and we see that it's a time squared. So let's go and manipulate that and use this to our advantage. So we can substitute that z equation into the other ones, and now we're going to, we have neglected on the lowest order things that are omega, and we neglected that only in the z because g is so much bigger than omega that it just doesn't, we don't, we don't use it, but we will accept it in the other two. But we're also going to say that it's, since it's small, we'll only keep omega to the first power in things that are also small. So if you have something that's small and it's compared to something big, you can get rid of the small part, so because the big part is big. But in this case, so therefore in the z, the big part is gravity, and the small part is that. But in the x and y components, the big parts are the omega are the omegas, and the small parts are anything that would be omega squared. So we can approximate all of these things using Taylor expansions, etc., in order to get the equation below. And that's what we're left with, which is these very simple equations that uh, look quite interesting. Notice that the x is not going to have a north-south deflection, but it will have a deflection that looks like it's going eastward, because y is defined to go to west, and the negative sign would then make it go east. And it goes by the time cube, which is fascinating. It also has, depends on the, the latitude, and it depends on how fast the thing is rotating. So that's an approximation. So the particle would be deflected eastward, and it would hit the ground roughly at the time, uh, the time of 2 times the height divided by the square root of gravity, the square root. That will give us the height at which it gets to 0. And therefore, the net eastward deflection as it strikes the ground is, is seen below. Now, if you look closely, that's not big. So it's a, not a large deflection, and that's an important thing to remember. Because this deflection, it, you know, let's, let's see how big that would be. And so it's in the same direction as the Earth's rotation, meaning going from west to east. It is biggest at the equator when cosine of lambda equals 1. And it's nothing at the poles. So cosine of the poles, cosine of lambda of the poles is 0, so there is no eastward deflection. But I guess there's no such thing as deflection at the pole at, of east anyway at the poles. But it's so small that we can say that if you drop something 100 meters, which is, you know, uh, I guess 5, 10, 10 stories or something, an 8-story building, 100 meters, it deflects by 2 centimeters. And that is um, one meter. It's two centimeters is two percent of one meter. So this is two percent of one percent. So this is a really small effect. It is measurable, but it's small. So therefore, we are justified, given the result that 
we that of our assumption that the Coriolis effect is small compared to the Earth of, the, the gravitational effect. So to the lowest order, we're okay. If we really wanted to add in and go back to those equations and say we're not going to approximate it, we're going to plug it into a computer and do it right, quote, do it right, you wouldn't get too much of an adjustment. It might be 2.3 centimeters, it might be 2.22 centimeters, it might be small, but it's not going to be a huge adjustment from 2.2 centimeters. So therefore, that's why we bother with these kinds of approximations in physics, because that helps us do something and get something a little bit better than, than that and not give us such problems with computing power and trying to write that, uh, that program in Python or, or whatever you want to write it in, MATLAB, it doesn't even matter, or you know Java Basic or JavaScript or whatever you want to write it in. But you don't have to if you have a good set of approximations that leads you to a place. And as long as the end result makes sense. See, we would have to go back to the drawing board and say, ah, we got to look at it better. If the deflection was like 10 meters, then that's pretty big, and that, that would be something we would we would want to look more closely at because if the deflection according to this was 10 meters, then the real deflection might be something on the order of 20 meters. And that's enough to say, okay, we should probably have that. But reality is that Coriolis effect is small, and therefore our justification for these approximations is a good one. So let's continue on with this idea, and now let's think of a particle that is launched horizontally with, no, with some really big velocity and no up and down motion. So this is really going fast. Um, you know, it's going to skid across some pavement or something because, you know, gravity pulls things down, but let's just assume that it's launched horizontally and it's going to go across the surface of the Earth. Maybe we're just launching it horizontally on an ice sheet. So we're doing a very high bullet on an ice sheet. Well, that's kind of a scary thought. But now we're also going to define the compass bearing, theta, uh, which is that Greek letter theta. And so we have the x direction is cosine of theta, which would be up is 1, and to the uh, east is 0. But theta, so north is 0 degrees and east is 90 degrees, etc., which is kind of what you think when you look at a, a map. And so kind of we've defined previously, in the previous thing, we defined our Cartesian system. We defined it not map-wise, we defined it kind of looking up-wise. But this is actually uh, more looking map-wise. So, which is important because historically and people kind of look down on maps. So let's say you see how we do things. So we're going to do the same kind of derivation before. We're going to neglect vertical motion uh, because whatever, you know. But We'll also take things, uh, and so uh, we're also going to make sure this is without, without vertical isolation. We're also going to assume that omega is a small value compared to the force of gravity. So let's keep going down that path, and we find that we get these particular set of equations. So this is where we're going to be deriving. Uh, uh, we have we have these things now to approximate it. So our velocity is this. We now have no z component. We uh, we're neglecting all vertical motion, and we only have and all and we only have an x and a y components. We only have an acceleration. We have a deceleration in x and y. That's interesting. Okay, so let's look closely, and we can integrate those two things above to get the velocity components, which we kind of had before, but now we have the velocity that's changing. So we had an initial velocity, which is which is the left hand side of the after the approximation, but the right hand side comes about because we're integrating with respect to time for the change in velocity due to the Coriolis acceleration, and so. We look closely at this and we say, wait a second, there is a value that's happening here and there is a change in the compass bearing. So we see that it's dependent upon the compass bearing, so that looks awful lot like a rotation. So let's see how that works. All right. So that equation is kind of gnarly, but we can do some simplification by remembering some 10th grade geometry. We can use these sine a angle plus angles, and this is going to be really helpful because if we look closely, um, we can use all this mess, those particular things, and they, we can see, wait a second, we can pull out the V, we can pull, we can pull out the V, that's, a, that's easy enough, and we're left with 
cosine theta minus something else, so minus 2 omega sine theta sine theta t. But let's see if we can make that even easier. But if we apply this formula, we get the following. x dot looks like um, v, v naught cosine, theta, cosine of the sum of those two things. So look closely at these equations, and we see that we can substitute in and get rid of the small bits. Now, cosine of an angle is like 1 plus omega squared, uh, angle squared. And sine of an angle is like angle plus angle cubed. So we don't care about the angle squared, and we don't care about the angle cubed. We only care about ones and angles. And one is bigger than the angle, so that's how we get the equation for x dot below. So you'll notice that the omega sine, uh, sine lambda part of the cosine a plus b disappears because it's small compared to the other. Because it's cos cos, uh, cosine of cos a plus cos b equals the cosine a times the cosine of b. And here b is 2 omega sine lambda t. And we just plug these things in, and if you use these small angle use the small approximation saying that theta is greater than 2 omega sine, om, sine lambda t, and very specifically, Oh, lambda squared and lambda cubed are going to be things that we ignore. So therefore, anything like cosine of omega sine theta simply becomes 1, and anything like uh, sine of 2 omega sine lambda becomes just becomes 2 omega sine theta lambda. So it does, we don't, we we're left with the actual thing. We actually actually left with those variables, and we can have this nice little approximation, which then ends up looking like this. Therefore, we have the same angle change in both the x and y direction. One is negative, one is positive, so therefore it's a rotation. And the rotation rate is the change in theta with respect to time, which is approximately, now we're, we're just going back and making sure we, we establish this approximately, because these are approximate. 2 omega sine lambda. Now we could go and do a full numerical analysis on this, and sure, we get slightly different results, but not by much. So the rotation would then be clockwise, looking from up down from above in the northern hemisphere, the counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. There's no rotation rate, uh, there's no rotation at the equator, and there's the most rotation at the poles. That's interesting. All right. So let's continue on, and we see then that the Coriolis force is very significant. We see it all the time. It, it's a part of our weather patterns. Near the, therefore, the intense heating at the sur Earth's surface near the equator, uh, where, it gets, uh, where it gets almost all sunlight all the time, uh, results in there, and hot air is rising up. And so hot air rises. Uh, cool air then goes in from the north or from the south in order to, in order to fill the, basically the flow where the hot air is rising up, and that hot air then flows north. So you have this circular, uh, or a circular flow that happens at low altitudes in general, from uh, from north towards the south, and then from the south towards the north in upper latitudes. And these are called trade winds. And so the Coriolis force deflects the moving air that happens due to this exchange of heat uh, between the equator and the uh, lower atmosphere, the equator and the upper atmosphere. So, these th so therefore we get hurricanes. And hurricanes uh, means that the cooler air is moving northward in the southern hemisphere, and in the, in the cooler air is moving southward in the northern hemisphere. And the Coriolis effect deflects it, uh, and we get the trade winds, which are indicated by these arrows, uh, and westerlies move from the west, and easterlies move from the east. So you can, well, you can consider them like they don't really have easterlies, so we have these three different things. So the trade winds are Due to the fact that uh, due to the fact of the, uh, the, the the change of the heat transfer. Okay, so what does this end up making us look like? So 
the Coriolis force drives these cyclonic rotations that we see. So when we say that the, the Coriolis acceleration is a fictitious or pseudo force, we don't mean it doesn't exist. We just mean it's not a Newtonian force. Cyclonic action and rotation would not happen if the Earth were not rotating. And specifically, the shapes of these things wouldn't have their shape if the Earth wasn't a sphere as well. So there is just the existence of the rotation of the Earth is seen because of this. So, you know, flat Earth rotate them. But anyway, we keep going. Um, these tropical storms, and here's a series of them, uh, and cyclones. I believe this is a, uh, I forget which, this is a definite hurricane season. That's a big old hurricane going across Cuba. When there's one devel uh, developing or crashing into the Gulf there, and there's another one right behind the other hurricane coming right up. So this cyclonic rotation uh, is evident in the Coriolis force, uh, but it's not part of your bathtub. Notice the center of the hurricanes. There's a large area where we do not see any motion. In fact, it's well known that inside the center of a hurricane, it's calm. So right up to that point, the wall of the eye of the hurricane, it can be quite violent weather, but once you're in the, wet, in the middle of it, it can be dead calm. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have a dead calm in your, if you do have a dead calm in the center of your pipe as you're draining out of your bathtub, uh, but that's due to the shape of the pipes and the shape of the tub, not due to Coriolis effect. Anyway, so we will leave that here, and there's a bit more on the Coriolis Pseudo force? I'm going to leave it with pseudo force. I hate fictitious force, but we'll leave it with pseudo force because it doesn't obey Newton's third law, meaning there's an, not an equal and opposite reaction, meaning this cyclonic rotation doesn't twist the Earth the other way. That's what we would mean. So if, if the Coriolis force were a true Newtonian force, that action of rotation would actually cause a twisting motion on the Earth in the other way to something that couldn't push back. And in fact, if you would say, well, what would be the natural thing? Oh, you've got a cyclonic rotation in the atmosphere. Maybe the, the ocean would, would rotate that way. But no, the ocean just keeps also gets swept up in the air rotation. You can see waves moving that way, but they don't push back against it. There's no friction between the, uh, I mean, I guess there is, because there's no friction that pushes against that. And that is, uh, well, you know, I guess if you look hard enough, you can find it, but the rotation of the Coriolis force, and by rotate, look for it hard enough, we can find it, we mean that Air does have friction against when you hear the wind howling, it's because it's the molecules of the air are rubbing up against something like a building or a mountain or whipping waves up. And yes, that's causing friction, and yes, that's dissipating energy. But it's not like it's actually having something that pushes against where there's an equal and opposite reaction. There is no equal and opposite reaction that is that happens due to this hurricane. So there's the Coriolis effect uh, pseudo force on it that is strictly due to the fact that the Earth is rotating. All right, so next time we're going to be talking about the uh, Foucault pendulum uh, and, uh, and how we can see that the Earth is rotating without satellite technology. <laughs> we can just simply have a Foucault pendulum. A pendulum is a specific thing that says, yes, the Earth is rotating. We can, if we have a satellite looking down from orbit, we can certainly see that. Also, we can see the Earth is rotating if you happen to go be on the moon and look back and see it. So there is a bit more about our rotating reference frames. We've done, uh, we've established, we've derived the equation in the upper left. We've also looked at now at the centrifugal acceleration, which is the second term, and the Coriolis acceleration, the third term. So we're going to put some of this together to look at the Foucault pendulum next time and see how we see that the Earth is rotating. And we are looking at the fourth of a series of slides in Newtonian mechanics dealing with rotating reference frames. And the previous two, we looked at the Coriolis effect, 
as well as the centrifugal acceleration effect. Uh, and we defined in the first one the nature of a rotating reference frame so that we could do those other two. Now we're going to round it out with a sh with the demonstration of how we know that the Earth is rotating using a Foucault pendulum. So a Foucault pendulum is a simply a pendulum that is hanging from a very from a very 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 long very stiff wire so there's a heavy bob at the end and very long wire and we're also making something that has a very uh, long period for its oscillation but it also has to not go very far we want it to have a very small angle that it's changing through so that when we actually see the pendulum bob going back and forth, it's not moving by much. It just has to be able to do this consistently for a very long period of time in order for you to see it. All right, so what is all this about? So let's look again at our equation that we derived in the first slide. It's the mass times the acceleration in the rotating reference frame is equal to the force, the real force, a, a Newtonian force that obeys all three Newton's laws. And the, set, the, the first one is the... Uh, centri is the uh, centrifugal acceleration, which is the uh, which is the second one, and then the third one is the Coriolis effect, which has the effect of things that are moving inside of a rotating reference frame. So what we're going to do is we're going to have some pendulum. It's going to have some kind of compact mass, so suspended from an extremely light cable, but that is stiff. It is not going to waggle or bend in the wind, and. The pendulum is free to oscillate in any direction. It's not just on a hinge, it's not like a ball hinge or something. So it can go in any direction it needs to. Uh, and then the plane that it's oscillating in shall be normal to the Earth's surface, meaning straight up and down. If it's hanging straight without any orientation, it'll be just hanging straight up or down. The mass is then subject to only three forces. First, the force of gravity, which is directed always downward. Second, the tension in the cable, which is pulling upward. And third is the Coriolis force, which is due to the rotation of the Earth. So because of the equation of motion and mass in the reference frame that we're going to be looking at, we have a new equation that is shown below, which is we add the real, the, the capital F then is replaced by mg plus t, and so those are our two forces. We are ignoring the centripetal, centrip centrifugal force in this uh, analysis. So, just like in the previous videos, I broke it down into cart Cartesian coordinates inside the rotating reference frame, <clears throat> of the Earth's surface. So we're doing this on the surface of the Earth, just like in the previous two videos. And we have the effective gravitational acceleration, which is g tick, which is equal to the real gravitational acceleration plus the tension uh, modified by the mass of the plumb bob. And then you subtract out the Coriolis, the, uh, Coriolis effect. And once you break that down into the three Cartesian coordinates, x, y, and z, where x is pointed north, y is pointed west, and z is pointed straight up, we get these components for those three things. Notice there's an x and y and z component for the tension, but there's only a z component for the gravitational force, and the Coriolis force affects all of them. All right. So that messy thing can be collected and simplified, as we see below. And so we are looking at specifically, because remember, G tick arrow is three components. It is x double dot, y double dot, and z double dot, where dot is the derivative with respect to time. So each of those things are the change, the acceleration in the x direction uh, is, is the first equation, acceleration in the y direction, acceleration in the g direction of the mass. So we are using the same kind of thing as we did before. This is just rewriting and making it prettier from the previous thing. And so v is going to be like v sub x will be x dot, v sub y is y dot, and v sub z is z dot. So those dot notations make it a lot easier to write out. Okay, so now we go further and say, let's use some of our assumptions. We're going to now 
use those equations and try to simplify them so we can actually solve them, because those are tricky equations to solve. I mean, you can solve them directly numerically from there, but let's actually see if we can do some semi-analytical stuff and actually make some approximations to help us. The first thing we're going to assume is that the displacement of the swing of the pendulum is small. So it's not a big swing. We're not going to be swinging this thing back and forth. We're not going to be like the, like the kid in the park who is trying to get the swing to go over the top of the bar. No, this is a very small swing. And so the length L is going to be very long compared to the distance R that we see in this diagram, uh, comparatively speaking. So this, should, this triangle is actually pretty out of proportion. We want it to be very small angle. So that theta right there doesn't look big. It looks pretty big by comparison for what we're going to look at in reality. The vector r shows how far away and in what direction we're pushing the mass, mass away from its rest, rest position. Okay, so we can push it in any direction we want, but if we push it in the x direction, then r, vector r tick, it will be x tick, will be the same as x tick, which will be the same as L sine theta. So that would be the true if we push it in the y direction. And if we push it off in some random angle, uh, uh, phi, then between the x and y axis, then theta itself wouldn't be affected. It's just the amount of x or y in the direction that we have. That's what that effect of theta is. So if the displacement is small, then the angle of deflection is small, and therefore the magnitude of the r vector is approximately x. Let's say we're just keeping it in the x plane. If the magnitude of the r vector is, pro is x tick, and that's equal to L sine theta. And if it's a small deflection, then sine theta is approximately theta. Remember, we're not measuring theta in degrees. We're measuring in radians. So that's why we can use sine theta and just make it theta there. It doesn't work if you're doing it in degrees. The same would be true for y. And therefore, we would have the, the order of magnitude of the displacement in x is like L theta. And the same is for y. So y is roughly y theta. But the displacement in z is much smaller because z tick is l minus l cos theta, which is on the order of l theta squared. Because cosine of theta, when theta is small, is one plus is roughly like one plus theta squared. So z tick, and we have to start from it, we're saying the displacement is a little bit above because we, we don't have any displacement in x, but we do have some in z. So we have a very tiny displacement in z, which would be uh, theta squared. So, but it's a small theta. Therefore, we're going to ignore all vertical displacements and set z tick to zero. That leads to the following things below. So, Sine of theta is roughly the magnitude of the r vector uh, divided by the length of the of the uh, of the of the line that goes down to the plumb bob, and therefore we can actually and x is equal to that. There's my theta. There's my phi thing is the magnitude of r times cosine of phi, uh, which and there's y would be the magnitude of r cosine of phi, and so those are l sine theta cos thi and sine thi. But we're going to get rid of those really soon. We're just I'm just making it there for completion purposes. Okay, so those are our actual values for x and y, where z value change is extremely small and we've ignored it. So now let's look at the tension. So the way we have is a tension diagram. So I've overlaid the tension force on top of that. And I've kind of ignored putting in the mass, the gravitational force, because you know I only have like so much space on my, on my slides. So let's just keep going. Pretend like there's an m, there's a g acceleration going straight down away from t cos theta. That would be the acceleration due to gravity downward. But we don't. That's not what we're worrying about right now. We're worried about the tension uh, sections. So the vertical displacement is t cosine theta, and for small theta, again, that's t because of the the nature of cosine. And so for the horizontal component, we get the following. So We've displaced it just a little bit, so we have t horizontal in some direction equals t sine theta times the, times r uh, r tick divided by the magnitude of r tick, and that means what that thing in the r with with the r tick vector divided by magnitude r, which is, I guess I should have put a vector in there too, but that's just what we're trying to show with that latter part, with that latter ratio at the end, is that it's in the direction of r, 
right? So that's what we care about. We care about it being in the direction of the radial vector. So how do we then translate that? So it's approximately equal to t, t divided by L, because look, sine, we've, just, we've because we've previ previously defined sine of theta is equal to the magnitude of the R vector divided by L. But if we have the sine of, sine of theta divided by the magnitude, that's just basically 1 over L. So that's what I've done in the second part where they make the, simula the roughly simulated so that it's roughly, sine theta is still roughly that change because, you know, we, we do have to take into account some way of saying, yeah, there's a little bit of a z displacement, but we're not too worried about that, so that's why I'm retaining the sim equals in that uh, bottom equation just for completion purposes. And if that's the case, so it's t over l in the radial direction, radial direction should have a little bit of a z component, but we're ignoring it for now, okay? That's equal to t over l in the x component plus t over l in the y component. And that's how we would translate that out. So now we've got our horizontal components and we can go all the way back up and put it all together. The equations of motion for the pendulum are now written below. X double dot, which is the derivative, which is the acceleration in the X direction in the rotating reference frame, is equal to T L over L M, which we, which we had from before, times X tick plus 2 omega sine lambda. Lambda, of course, is the latitude from which we are measuring it, and omega is the, is the magnitude of the angular, angular speed of the rotation of the Earth. So, all right, so that's like 24 hours. It goes 2 pi radians, right? That's what that is. And then there's y dot tick, which is the which is the velocity in the y direction. And so notice because z we've defined z to be zero, then z z, t, z dot is zero, and z double dot is zero. So these equations have simplified quite a bit. So let's actually let's actually get even closer to this thing. So notice in the third equation we have the tension and gravity, and then we've got a small part which is the rotation and the latitude with the v with the with the velocity in the rotating reference frame of y. So we're gonna we're gonna do another little bit here and make one more assumption. We're going to note that the tension and the force of gravity are a much larger influence in general than on the plumb bob. So those two things combined are a much larger influence. Therefore, in the last equation, we're going to neglect to the omega term, and we're going to get that t that the tension is approximately equal to mass times gravity, and that's about right, right? Because if we let it hang straight and true, and there's no push to it, then that would certainly be true. So any change to that's going to be a very very small thing. So let's then let's go with that. Just let's go with this. We could always just go through and plug this into a computer and let it chug. But if you did that, you're going to get a very small correction. I mean, you can. I mean, it's kind of a, is that you, I mean, there's nobody telling you you can't. You can create your own Python script and do this, compile it and put the numbers in and see what you get. But you're going to find that it's not a very big effect. So this is an analytical way of saying, you know, just because the computer is going to do it, it can do it, it could do it. Sure, we could just we could have stopped at the very beginning and plugged all those things into an into a computer and said, I don't know which is big and small, and gotten out the answer. But if we use a little bit of judgment, like I'm doing right now, we can actually say, ah, how close will we be? And the answer is really close, not far off at all. Um, at the end. So let's continue. We'll say that t is approximated by mg and we'll substitute that in and we get the following thing in our equation. So we've substituted t equals mg into the equation. We got g over l in that instead of t over m l, right? So and we've eliminated the last equation. So we only have an acceleration in the x direction and an acceleration in the y direction. We have no change in the z direction, which is kind of what we expected, right? So that's good. And so we're neglecting the last, that we, neg we neglected that last term, that's our next step. And so we only have these two equations. Let's see what we can do to rearrange. In order to give, to solve them as functions of time, we need to make use of, uh, of, a, of some important uh, relationships. So let's do the first thing. And notice that we're going to create a new variable. 
s. And s will be equal to x tick plus i y tick. And we can take the derivatives of each of those things, and they'll be derivatives equal, uh, of themselves like that. But i is the imaginary number, the square root of minus 1. All right, a lot of people will balk at that and say, why the heck are you doing that? I mean, that sounds like a pain in the tuchus. It isn't, really. So let's actually see what these two equations look like if we do that. And they actually look a little bit better. So first we're going to substitute that, that value on the left-hand side, all three of those things, into the equations above and add them together. And that's the first line here. We got gl of x tick, and there's minus i gl y tick. So we see both of those things from the top two equations. And we have the two omega sine lambda y tick and the two minus two i omega sine the, uh, lambda x tick. So there's our first First step. Now let's combine things together that are likes, and we see that, wait a second, we got a minus gl, that's an x plus y, i, y tick, hmm, and then we can extract those things out. We also have an x dot plus i dot, oh, I shouldn't have a dot over that i, whoops, that was a dumb thing, but it's an i dot, so why not? But it's, not, it's a different dot than that, it's a dotted i, not a derivative with respect to i. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but it should just, uh, wow, the, the typography there is very interesting, isn't it? Anyway, we're not too worried about that. So the first thing is going to be just simply s, and we're substitute s dot in for the last thing. Now that's actually really good, because now we have something we can use. We can now look for a sinusoidally varying solution to the last equation in this form, which is just the exponential e to the i minus i omega t, where s naught, which is the coefficient out front, is just some arbitrary complex constant. It'll be something else like a plus b i or what have you. And the omega is a real valued angular frequency of the oscillation. That's going to be what's really the oscillation we're going to experience for the plumb bob. That's important. We're finally getting at the frequency of the oscillation because that's a sinusoidally varying solution. So let's plug s now into this thing using these values when you do that uh, and take the derivative of this and then the second derivative. We get the following quadratic equation in omega. This is good. Quadratic equations are good. Why do we like quadratic equations? Because we can solve it in a normal way with our old friend that we used back in, in, in 10th grade that we learned about the quadratic equation, and that's what I've done in the first below. Um, so we, I've just basically used minus negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac, and that's what we've got divided by 2a. And that's, remember that old thing from grade school, that's what I just recited. And that's approximately equal to sine omega sine theta plus or minus gl. Why? Because we're eliminating anything that's omega squared because that's small compared to g over l. So there we go. We comp we're competing. We're, we, we've done a nice little approximation. We've got our omega. And now we have a plus or minus. That means we have two solutions, one for s plus and one for s minus, where we have an omega in the plus direction and an omega in the minus direction. And so we look for those two arbitrary complex constants, and our two solutions are omega plus and omega minus. So let's now make the radical choice that s plus or minus is the same thing, and we're going to call it a over 2. Why? It becomes convenient. And that's just some arbitrary real value constant, like 1 or 2, not 1 plus 2i. Now when we put this all together, we get this crazy looking thing, which is s equals a, which is, we don't care about that constant, it's just some constant is equal to e to the i, my, the, the, that's a power then, minus i omega sine lambda times t. And that's important. Because there's the sine lambda is, is, a, is its own constant, right? So omega t is the real thing. It's not sine of lambda t. It's sine, sine lambda omega t. I guess I should have written it like that. But this is pretty typical what you'd see. And we got that cosine on the outside. That's not part of the power. So where did this come from? 
All right, so real quick where that came from is I just plugged in those solutions into this equation. We see there's the, uh, the, uh, the omega plus, and we see the omega minus, and then we're collecting the like terms because we can extract out the i omega sine lambda t out of both of them, and we're left with an i uh, glt in the positive direction and i gl i square root glt in the negative direction. And funny enough, is that e to the i theta is e to the i theta is actually a trigonometric solution and you can break out e to the i some value equal to cosine of that value plus i sine of that value and that's what's happened in the third line of this thing so we've got all the because cosine of some angle plus i some angle the same angle is equal to e to the i of the angle which is a really interesting little identity. Go look it up if you like. Uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, that's a geometric trigonometric relationship, which is a lot of fun. And this is a really good thing to use from complex analysis. It's very helpful for the algebra because these things are identities that come from complex uh, uh, or complex algebra, I should call it, where you use the imaginary numbers as your as your guiding tool, and they're just as valid as any other number, just like pi or zero or 1 over 12 or whatever. Uh, negative i is a valid number and you can do algebra on it. All right, so we collect like terms and notice that the cosine of a negative val of a negative theta, a negative angle, is the same as the cosine of a positive same angle. So we just add those together to get twice of those. And then we extract out the i sine and we find that, wait a second, we have i sine minus i sine and those things are, oh wait, the negative of a sine is the same as the positive of a sine because the sine of an angle is going to be uh, is if you take the negative of the angle you get the sine of the, the it becomes the negative sine uh, right sine of the negative angle is the negative of the of the of the application so we we go up right so if you take the sine of an angle is either up. And if it's negative, it's down, but the sine would be positive or negative as a result. And so sine of negative theta equals negative sine theta. That's, that's how that works, because we're going the opposite direction around the circle. So those two last things cancel, and we're left with what we'd showed before. Okay, great. Now we remember, go all the way back and say, oh, wait, 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 s equals x tick plus i y tick, because we're looking at Cartesian coordinates, not this, not all this stuff with uh, complex coordinates and so forth. We want to get it to the function x and y as a function of time as, and a function of the angular frequency that the plumb bob is going back and forth on. So let's plug the a, a, plug x and y, s back into this thing. Remember that s is equal to this x and y. But notice that e to the i some angle is cosine of an angle plus i sine of an angle. And by gosh, there it is, we've got that, which is exactly what we had before. So we've got x and y sticking out right there that to both of us. So we've got x equals cosine. I, I should have put big parentheses in there because it's not just a cosine theta kind of plus the second one. There should be big parentheses uh, enclosing both the cosine and this i sine function there because I broke it apart. So uh, I, I, that's, a, that's a terrible typo. I really wish I could fix that, but off we go anyway. Uh, so x is equal to the cosine part and y is equal to the sine part. And now we see we've gotten that, there's, that they're nearly identical. So these two equations describe sinusoidal oscillations in a plane that's normal to the parallel, that's normal to the Earth's surface, and par whose normal the plane is always up and down with respect to the Earth's surface, and has a standard pendulum frequency of GL over T. That's the normal pendulum frequency that if you were to solve, oh wait, ignore everything about the uh, Coriolis effect. That's what you'd get if you did this entire analysis. Oh, very simple. The Coriolis effect, though, however, plops that cosine or sine of omega sine t, so on a sine lambda times t. So the omega, once again, remember, is the uh, is the angular is the angular rotation of the Earth now. 
So that's where omega comes in here. So we've, we lost that little omega because that was the sinusoidal frequency of the plumb bob. We're not really too worried about that. We're worried about the position of x and y now. So the period of the precession, and the, now the, the, the plane precesses around, around its axis. So that means the plane slowly t shifts the orientation of x and y. It'll always change a little bit in x and a little bit in y uh, after some time. So how long will it take? Depends on the latitude, it, the period of the precession, meaning how long does it take for the plane to rotate completely around, is 24 hours divided by the sine of the latitude. So the pendulum oscillates in the x direction, north-south. Let's say it, let's say we've got this pendulum oscillating in the x direction, north-south, and in the y direction. And, and, it, and after the period divided by four, it will be rotated in the y direction, east and west. And then it'll be back in the x direction at period equals half, halfway around. And then it'll be, and then at period three quarters, it'll be uh, the plane will have oscillated back to the x direction, back to the y direction, and then one full rotation later, it will be back to the original uh, orientation. So this precession is clockwise from the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. So the change in the direction that the plumb bob is going. It, it basically means that if you have a pendulum and you start it swinging and you don't move at all and just stand there for hours, and this is a proper Foucault pendulum, after a while, what will happen is if you're in the northern hemisphere and you just let that pendulum go and you're standing, you're the one who pulls it towards you and then you let it go and you stand there and simply wait. Because it will rotate clockwise, as seen from above, then what will happen is the plum will bob, will start to slowly come towards you, but then miss you to the left. And then it'll keep missing you more and more and more to the left. It'll keep arcing more and more to your left. And eventually, if you stood there long enough, say 24 hours, more than that, much longer than that at, at higher latitudes, but at uh, at at uh, it, it so at the poles it'd be exactly 24 hours and it's longer and longer and longer as you get closer and closer to the equator, but the mid latitudes it's pretty long but you'll actually be able to measure it over the course of a day if it's a proper pe focal pendulum meaning there's no friction on the attachment to the roof. Um, and there's nothing getting in the way, and if it happens to be in a museum, which a lot of these are, which there's a bunch of these that exist all over the world, and there's no kids getting in the way, nobody jumping in the way, nobody's messing with it, and maybe even you've enclosed it in a vacuum chamber. Maybe you've gotten rid of all that stuff. Maybe you've even put it in a dark place so that there's no effective heat on the inside for changing its direction due to heat or wind or anything. So this actually happens, and it's due to the Coriolis force effect, which is due to the Earth rotating. So as the Earth rotates, we get this slight change with the plumb bob in the northern hemisphere. Goes more When it comes towards you, goes more and more and more to your left. And eventually, it comes all the way around, which is pretty cool. Um, this was first devised in 1851 by Foucault, and to this day, there is an exact copy in the Pantheon in Paris where, where Foucault actually set this up. Uh, it was moved to a different location for a long time, many decades, and moved back to the Pantheon. Uh, but the original, actual original plum bob that Foucault made uh, fell and broke in, I believe, 2005 or 2010. Uh, you go look it up on YouTube to see where it, where it actually broke. But I believe that it's on display in the Pantheon there alongside this exact replica. So if you go and check it, you can see where it is. Uh, well, also, you can, you can uh, see how, what the, the, ch the movements of it. And you'll notice that the, the wire that it's hanging from is very straight. It's very light. 
and the blob does not appear to move very much, and that ceiling is very tall compared to the area that it's swinging across. So that's what we mean by a small, small orientation, and this is obviously it's at rest. It's not swinging, of course. But it's important to know that this is one of our big proofs that shows that A, the Earth is round, because you can put this, the period of oscillation is different for different latitudes, and B, the Earth is rotating. So this is a really important uh, discovery that can only be, that is best explained. Now you can make up any kind of crazy mathematics you want, like flat earthers do. They make up a lot of crazy stuff. But we try to go for the simplest solution that works and that fits everything, and we don't have to have ad hoc things going left and right in order to keep your idea alive. That's the problem with the flat earth people, is that they, they don't basically know when to give up. <laughs> or more specifically, you got to hand it to their tenacity because they'll just keep making stuff, but I don't see why they bother because it's more and more and more and more complex, everything they do. It's a lot easier just to say that the Earth is round and it's rotating, and that's very simple. It makes the explanation simple, it makes the thinking simple, and it fits so many observations, and it also allows us to predict things that we otherwise couldn't predict. And so this is one of many things that helps us understand that the Earth is round, and of course if you see it from space, like the astronauts did this from the Apollo 8, you definitely know that it's round. And this will round out, as it were, our discussion of, the, uh, of rotating reference frames. Thanks so much for joining me.